A very good day to you and welcome to the program. It's just so good to be with you again. I hope you've got that hot cup of coffee, cup of tea. You're going to relax and put your feet up because we've got a very appropriate word for you for these times in which we are living. I don't know if you've experienced it. It's all over the world. There seems to be so much tension. People seem to be angry with each other. There seems to be a lot of frustration going on. Everywhere you look, there seems to be tension, whether it be the Middle East, whether it be the continent of our beloved Africa, whether it be in the United States of America, South America, Great Britain, there is there's tension. Whether it be political, uh, folks, people are, are, seem to be living on the edge, on their nerves. We really need to take this opportunity to show folk that we are different. Not just to tell them, but to show them by our actions. If you go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 15 and verse 1, there's a beautiful scripture here I want to share with you. Proverbs, chapter 15 and verse 1 in the New King James Version says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Isn't that amazing? I'll read that again. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And that's the last thing that you and I want to do in this time, is to stir up more anger. Whether it be in your family, you know, financially, a lot of people are struggling. We see the currency devaluing all over the world. Okay, so there's pressure on mom and dad in their own relationship, maybe in their marriage. There's pressure at school. We need to be gentle with each other. And if your brother happens to be a bit harsh, give him grace. Give him loving kindness because you don't know what he's going through. You see, a harsh word is actually a word of pain. When you say something in a harsh manner, you hurt people. right? You say, well, Angus, I don't mean it. No, but you've got to stop it. Because especially your children, when they come home from school, they've been subjected maybe to harsh words at school, not from the teacher even, but from fellow pupils. And we need to understand that wise words promote calm interactions. Wise words. Now, you know, I'm, I'm in favor of discipline. Yes, because I believe the word of God. You know, spare the rod, spoil the child. Right? A good hiding won't uh, cost your son his life. It might actually save it one day. I don't have a problem with that. But we need to be gentle with each other in the home. We need to give each other grace. You know, as I'm talking to you now, there's a dove just above us and it's singing. I don't know if you can hear it on the program, but I want to tell you it means peace. Shalom. The peace of the Lord be with you. The name of this farm is Shalom. But it's not always peaceful here. <laughs> we live in the real world here. And there's times when there's tension uh, on the farm. Uh, maybe the, the rain is not coming and we're in a bit of a drought at the moment. <clears throat> That's an understatement. And so everybody is tense. It's hot. We need to be careful what we say and we need to bring a gentle word and a gentle answer. Encourage one another rather than discourage one another. You know, sarcasm is the lowest form of wit. What are you saying, Angus? I'm saying... When you have a go at somebody and you, and, you, and you pull them down, it's always at the other person's expense, never at your expense. So to be sarcastic doesn't mean to say that you're clever. It just means that you've been ugly to somebody else. Okay, so you make a joke of a girl at school because her hair is done differently to everybody else. What does that make her feel like? We need to get away from that. As Christians, we don't do that. And some of us have got a habit of doing that. I've had to work through that myself. I've got a quick tongue, and sometimes I need to bite my tongue so that the blood comes running down my cheek because I, I've got a, a way of retaliating, and God doesn't do that. Now, if we go to the Gospel of John chapter 8 and from verse 1, I want to read a little, a little um, scripture here that will show you how Jesus handled it when people tested him. Okay? Now, this is the story about the adulteress and how she faced the Lord. Remember the story. The Pharisees got this woman. They caught her in the act, the Bible says. She was committing adultery 
with a man, obviously that was not her husband. They caught her and they brought her to Jesus. Now, the main reason for bringing her to Jesus wasn't because they wanted to know the truth. They wanted to catch him out. They wanted to set him up because they actually wanted to kill him. So it wasn't about the woman at all. And that, often that happens. A harsh answer is given to somebody because there's, a, there's, an under, there's another kind of a, a meaning underneath it. Okay? There's another agenda. We need to watch out for that. God doesn't honor that. Listen to this. I'm reading from John chapter 8, verse 1. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. But early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Listen to this, verse 6. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and he wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. Throw the first stone at her. Verse 8. And again he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Amazing, isn't it? And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And then Jesus spoke to them again, say, saying, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. A gentle answer turns away wrath. You see, Jesus could have said, well, according to the book of um, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, we've got to go take out and stone her. But he didn't do that, did he? And he also took his time. Folks, we're in too much of a rush. I'm talking about myself here as well. We're in too much of a rush to make a judgment. We're too much in a rush. And what happens? We say harsh words and we say things we don't mean. Now, you know something, folks? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. Have you ever heard that saying before? Well, I want to tell you it's the most useless saying ever because it's the exact opposite. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but your bones can get healed. But when nasty words, harsh words, unjust words have been spoken against you, they are not easily withdrawn. In fact, some people actually need deliverance because they've had parents or maybe a school teacher or a loved one that has spoken negatively after them and broken down their self-esteem where they've got no more self-confidence and they don't feel like they're a son of God, an ambassador for Jesus. We need to be careful. We need to speak life to each other and not death. And that's what Jesus did with that woman. He said to a woman, go and sin no more. You see, folks, the Bible is very clear about this in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So how can we be so self-righteous. A week ago, I spoke in a, a maximum security prison in Cape Town. And I had an experience of my life. I met some young men. They were juveniles. These men were between the ages of maybe 18 and about 25. I saw more love. I saw more passion, more hope, more life in those eyes than most people I see outside the jail. 
These young men have met Christ in a real way. And I had the privilege of speaking with them. They blessed me out of my socks. They could sing like angels. I went into their cells where they stay. You could have eaten the food off the floor. They took their duvets and they put them into the shape of a fan. I don't know how you do that with a duvet because it's very soft. They had photographs of their loved ones on their beds. They had Bible scriptures all around their cells. I had an education. And you know, when I spoke to these young men, this is how I started off. I said, chaps, I want to say something to you. The only difference between you and me is that you got caught and I didn't get caught. That's all. And then I just saw them relax, put their arms down, and they were ready to hear the word. We don't preach down to people. You always see people as better than yourself. You preach up to people. The Bible says all have sinned. I said, boys, when you have finished your sentence, you are free to go. I said, but for me and many of us on the outside who haven't been caught, we have to depend on the grace of God because we have not completed our sentence. You see, folks, Jesus says, if you look at somebody with anger in your heart, you've already committed murder. If you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. So that's why I'm saying all of us have fallen short. Now the Lord says we must use a gentle answer. When you see people as better than yourself, you won't be so quick to criticize them and to run them down and to break them down. A gentle word, a gentle word. I want to tell you a story that happened on this very farm many, many years ago when I was still actively farming. My sons are now farming and I'm speaking to you. <laughs> It was about this time of the year we were growing a beautiful crop of seed corn, maize. Now, with seed maize, what you're doing is you're trying to develop a certain type of maize. So you take two different varieties and you cross them. And then you get hybrid vigor. And those are the strong maize, the strong seed that the commercial farmer grows. In order to do that, you have to pull the flower out of the top of the maize plant before it sheds pollen so that the other flower can pollinate this cob. You get that cross-pollination. If the inspectors come to the farm and they find more than 1% pollen shed from the wrong plant, they condemn the whole plant. They condemn the whole crop, actually. And of course, that would mean total ruination for me because that's what I did. That was my main crop. And so... Folks, this one particular day, I'll never forget it as long as I live. God taught me about, a, about the gentle word, a gentle answer, to be gentle. We'd been working all day. Some of these women that were working with me, they were old enough to be my mother. I was probably in my early 40s in those days. And we'd been walking up and down these rows for miles, pulling out these flowers. It was extremely hot. We were tired. And come the end of the shift, we came out of, the, out of the, the, the fields. The woman was sitting down. They were getting ready, picking up all their, their lunch boxes and so on, and about to go home. When the inspector arrived from the company that we were growing for, and he did a quick duck into the corn, and he came straight out, and he said to me, Angus, I'm going to give you one hour. If you do not clean this field within one hour, unfortunately, I'm going to have to condemn the crop. Now, if he condemns the crop, that doesn't mean that you can sell the, the corn or maize commercially. You have to take a gyro mower and you have to cut it down and it's, use, it's useful, useless. We're talking now bankruptcy. He says, I'm going to give you one hour. I'm coming back. And so I went to the woman and I said, there was about 80 women there. I said, we have to go back. And they looked at me and I got quite aggressive and arrogant and loud and forceful. I said, do you hear me? We are going to go back. And they looked at me. They said, we're not going back. We are tired. We have finished our task and we are going home. They all stood up. They took their coats and their lunch boxes and they started walking down the road. And I stood there, folks. I'll never forget it as long as I live. And the Holy Spirit spoke in my heart. He said, you are arrogant. You are proud. And you are harsh. Now, if these women leave this farm, there they go walking down the road. This farm is bankrupt. You're going to have to leave with your wife and kids and go find a job somewhere. 
And I felt the Holy Spirit saying to me, speak to them properly and ask them nicely. And I spoke in my best Zulu. And I said to these women, please, whoa, 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 whoa. And they all stopped and they turned around. And I came up to them. I said, look, I said, I'm sorry. I've got no right to be harsh with you. You've done your job. You've done more than your job. You've worked well. But because of this heat, these tassels keep coming out. We have to go in there. Please help me. If you don't help me, I'm going to lose this farm. I'm asking you. Please, I need you. Totally different attitude. Totally different tone of voice. Not demanding anything. Asking. And these women were tired. Folks, I'm telling you something now. That, that whole lot, those 80 women, they turned around. And they came back and they put their coats down and they put their lunch boxes down. They said, Asam Ben, let's go. And in they went and they cleaned that field. An hour later, that inspector came back. He went in and he came out and he said, your field's clean. He gave me a certificate. He said, your field has been passed. It's okay. I could have lost that farm out of sheer arrogance and self-righteousness, but I didn't. And of course, I, I, I gave them a very, very nice gift because of that extra hour that they worked for me. People will do anything, for, well, almost anything for you, depending on how you ask them. Folks, be gracious. You know, it's an easy thing to take off your hat. It's an easy thing to have a smile. It's an, even that car watchman, that guy that's looking after your motor car, he, he's doing a job. He's working. When you give him a tip, give him a decent tip. Don't give him something that he can't even buy a Coke. Give him something and smile. And I'll tell you what, you'll make his day. And he'll make sure nobody steals, steals your car. We really need to exercise the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience. Because the world's got nothing. The world is desperate. And when people are ugly to you, you smile back to them. Because we've just read in the Word of God, a gentle answer can diffuse a bomb. You've got no right to fight fire with fire. Because where is it going to stop? You know, you say, Angus, but the Old Testament says an eye for an eye. And a tooth for a tooth. I want to tell you, if you and I employed that law, there wouldn't be anybody in this world that could see and no one would have any teeth. <laughs> I mean, that's the bottom line. We need to draw a line in the sand and say, we are followers of Jesus. What would Jesus do? Just imagine him drawing. I don't know what he wrote on the ground. People tell me he wrote all kinds of things. I don't know what he wrote. Maybe he was just biding his time because these Pharisees were so angry. They wanted revenge. And he let them just cool down a bit and he just carried on writing in the sand. Then he stood up. And he said, he was without sin. Wow. Throw the first stone. You see, when you look at your own life, you're not so quick to judge, are you? I want to say to you, a gentle answer is what works. Loving kindness is what works. I've got a beautiful scripture for you. I want to read out of the book of Jeremiah. Let me just find Jeremiah chapter 31 as we close and verse 3. Listen to this. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. When Jesus saved my life, folks, He drew me. I fell in love with the Savior of the world. He said to me, Angus, your sins are forgiven. Angus, you're a new man in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Isn't that amazing? I read something the other day. Listen to this. The master knocked on the door with a fist of iron from the law. When he knocked on that door, he shook that door so that the hinges were almost breaking down. But the little man inside with his wife and his children would not open the door. In fact, he took furniture and he stuck the furniture up against the door. He piled up every piece of furniture in his, home, in his house. And that man eventually, after banging on the door, the, the law, the fist of the law, he walked away. But then a man came back and with his own soft hand, using the part where the nail 
had penetrated. Oh, so softly and so tenderly he knocked on that door. He did not shake the door, but it opened automatically with no fuss. Come in, the man said and his family. I could not bear thinking of you leaving your blood-stained hand marked on my door. Your love has won my heart. When Moses came with the tablets of stone, he could never do what Christ did with his bloodied hand. Loving kindness always wins the day. The prodigal son, when he was met by his father, his father came running to his son. He kissed him warmly on the cheek as he walked into the home. And he said, son, welcome home. Why don't you try that in your family? You say, but Angus, it's not fair. They haven't been playing the game with me. They've let me down. They've disappointed me. Well, maybe you need to exercise grace. The same grace that Jesus exercised towards that prostitute or that woman, I should say, caught in adultery. She didn't deserve to live either according to the law, but God forgave her. And he said, go and sin no more. Maybe you and I need to do exactly the same. We're living in a world that is hell-bent on revenge and anger. And this is our finest opportunity to ex exercise the peace and the gentleness of Jesus Christ. So as it's quiet now, that dove is even quietened down in the tree. I want to pray for you that God will quieten your spirit. You see, out of the mouth flows what's in the heart. If you're angry in your heart, that's what's going to come out of your mouth. And I'm preaching this message, folks, because it, appear, it affects me as well. That's right. So let us pray. Will you close your eyes and pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for my friends that watch this program. Lord, we are desperately trying to live the life that you've called us to live. As that cow makes his presence known in the background. We want to say to you, Lord, please give us a gentle heart. If we can't say anything good about anybody, let us rather say nothing. But Lord, if we have to say something, let it be. I love you. I forgive you. And God loves you too. Lord, if ever we needed to be like Jesus in the sad world, it's now. We pray for your grace. Amen. Well, there we have it. You know what to do now. Go out and be Jesus to people. Don't, you don't even have to tell people about Jesus. Just be Jesus to people. Don't bash the door down. Knock softly. The door will be opened. So until the next time, God bless you. This